the first thing that you need to know is, have you got a business asset? The typical asset that you will find you're dealing with will be shares in a company. And to satisfy the requirement, you need shares in a, an unquoted trading company. And you may say, well, that's easy. We are happy that we have got shares in an unquoted trading company. So we do not have to worry about the rigours of um, gift relief because we are certain that we're home and dry. And I will say to you, don't be too certain. I will give you a salutary example of a case that I came across recently where a father had done exactly this. He had been advised by his current accountants that, oh yes, what you need to do to achieve your objectives is various things, starting with a gift of shares. And when I spoke to him and sort of asked a few questions, I said, are you sure, sure that this isn't going to trigger a horrendous capital gains tax problem? And he said, oh yes, I'm absolutely sure, because it is a trading company, you know. It is a trading company. Property development is what we do, it is a trading company. And I said, well, it is a trading company, yes, I give you that. The definition of trading company is relatively narrow nowadays, so if you have substantial non-trading activities, you will not satisfy the definition. The revenue, say, substantial means 20%. But let's assume that your non-trading activities are not substantial, so you are a trading company. But that is only the start of it, because in the legislation, there is something called Schedule 6. Schedule 6 of the Taxation of Chargeable Gains Act. And that tells us certain other rules about getting gift relief if you're dealing with shares in a trading company. And what that tells us is that you have to apply a fraction to the gain to determine how much of that gain can qualify for gift relief. And that fraction is pleasingly simple, but displeasingly capricious. The denominator, the bit under the line of the fraction, is the total chargeable assets of the company. Total chargeable assets of the company. The numerator is the non business chargeable assets of the company. So you have a fraction, yeah? you've got non-business, what they call non-business chargeable assets, which means assets not used for the purpose of trade, over total chargeable assets. And then with that in mind, imagine a balance sheet. And this balance sheet, I will give you the clue straight away, had investment properties on it. Yes, it was a trading company. Yes, it had a lot of properties in stock, but it also had rather a lot of properties which were unashamedly recorded as investment properties. 1.2 million pounds worth. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. So that is clearly a non-business chargeable asset, and it is also a chargeable asset. So currently, our fraction is 1 over 1, or, or 1.2 million over 1.2 million. Anyway, it is a unity. Now, we think, oh, this isn't looking too good at the moment. What we need now is loads more assets, which are business chargeable assets. We need to get that fraction tilted the right way. How are we going to do it? Let's look down that balance sheet and start recording all these oodles of other assets, which will be the right kind of asset for us. So what have we got? Oh, well, we've got some cash. Damn, it's not a chargeable asset. We've got some debtors. Damn, it's not a chargeable asset. We've got some stock and work in progress. Damn, it's not a chargeable asset. Uh, we've got some fixed assets, which are wasting assets. Damn, it's not a chargeable asset. Got those cars. Bugger, they're cars. Right, not a chargeable asset. You go down that balance sheet and you struggle to find anything, anything at all, which is a chargeable asset, which is a business chargeable asset. The only thing is something which is not on the balance sheet anyway, but it doesn't matter, we can still count it if it exists, is goodwill. But goodwill in a property development company, ooh dear, ooh dear, oh dear. So here we have a company which is a trading company, but when we do the fraction, I call this pitfall the 100 ICI shares pitfall. 
You see, all the time, a company with a tiny investment, tiny investment. This, this case, the case I was looking at, is quite a big investment. But you see, with a tiny investment, and there's nothing else chargeable. There's nothing else. So the only chargeable asset is an investment asset. You apply that fraction to the gain to arrive at what you're allowed to claim holdover relief on. And you know, I've expressed it as you know, one over one being the amount that you can't claim holdover relief on. I all of it, none of it you can claim on, or if you want to do it the other way around, it would be naught over one, which means that uh, none of the gain qualifies. But you know, either way, it's the same calculation, just expressed differently. So massive, massive trap. Handily, if you're aware of that trap, you might think, well, we can walk around it, because there is a second flavour of gift relief. It is specifically for non-business assets. It is under Section 260 of the Taxation of Chargeable Gains Act. And what's it about? It is about <coughs> assets that have been gifted in circumstances so that there is a charge to inheritance tax. We need a charge to inheritance tax. Now, father to son, a gift of shares from father to son, is that liable to inheritance tax? Well, it might be. It might be but it is not a chargeable transfer for inheritance tax purposes. It is a potentially exempt transfer. Even if the father drops dead within seven years, three years, three minutes, doesn't matter. Even if he drops dead, the transfer he made wasn't a chargeable transfer. It becomes chargeable because of his death if he dies too soon, I within seven years, but it was not chargeable when he did it. It was a potentially exempt transfer. It's no good to you. It is no good at all. To get a chargeable transfer, you need to make a transfer into trust. Before the 2006 Finance Act, it needed to be a discretionary trust. Now, any old trust will do. Unless it's a trust for disabled persons, but anyway, won't go into that. So, if you've got the issue, you can possibly walk round it in certain circumstances. Now, you will sit there thinking, he's gone mad. He's telling us all of a sudden that rather than pay capital gains tax, which might be at 10% with taper relief, not taper relief, entrepreneur relief, he wants us to trigger inheritance tax. And we've read somewhere that inheritance tax is 40%. Isn't this true? Is he mad? Well, it is true. Well, yes, I might be mad. But inheritance tax on a lifetime transfer is 20% or nil. Because inheritance tax is taxed at various rates, one of which is nil. What you need is an inheritance tax transfer which is chargeable, but chargeable at nil. And something that's chargeable at nil is very much like an exemption in my book. So no inheritance tax needs to be paid. If you have the right kind of company, you should get business property relief anyway. In our example, we've got a trading company for, for um, capital gains tax, business asset gift relief purposes, but we've got a few dodgy assets on it, that would probably not inhibit a claim for business property relief. So probably you could give away huge amounts of value without triggering any inheritance tax. So very interesting. Now, is that the end of the story? Well, the end of the story is not quite here because there are a few rules about this sort of thing. Rule number one is what I have used as my penultimate point, residence issues. And I meant to say this at the beginning, and I forgot, but I'll say it now. The UK capital gains tax regime is unusual in the context of the world. The big wide world has capital gains tax. Plenty of jurisdictions have capital gains tax. Why is the UK out of step with the rest of the world? The UK is out of step with the rest of the world because we only levy capital gains tax by reference to the resident status of the person making the disposal. If you are not resident in the UK, even though you might be selling a UK situated asset, a property in London, let us say, you don't pay capital gains tax, generally speaking. Some exceptions for assets used for the purpose of a trade conducted by a permanent establishment, but let's not go into all that. The general rule is not resident, no capital gains tax.